everyone, welcome to The Young Turks. I'm Anna Kasparian, John Iderola is Hello. here with us uh, today as he is on most other days. What's going on, John? Stuck the landing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how it's gonna be on today's show. And John show. is in attendance. As per his job description. Okay, <laughs> people are already very sensitive to the way that I talk to you, obviously, based on like some of the comp. Oh, it the was one, one thing. I know it was one comment, and I'm, at this point, I'm just joking around about it. But like, yes. no, you guys. No, some I'm gonna try to get this. I'm gonna try sure. to get this war raging. Okay, okay it's gonna be like don't. Lord of the Rings please up please in here don't. soon. I don't want any more wars. Okay, <laughs> no more wars. Uh, I'm excited to be here. It's Anna, gonna be a good show. who is my am co-host. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I wanted to just uh, draw attention to this beautiful mug. And it is you, awesome. Some of you might be thinking like, oh, here's another Shop TYT advertisement, which you should check out shoptyt.com because mm, we have awesome merch there. No, but this was actually sent in by one of our viewers and this is one of the coolest mugs. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, so Steve Creekmore is the person who made this and sent it over. Um, he sent about six of them and I, look, I want to discourage everyone from sending us gifts, okay? I don't want this to come across as send us gifts. We're gonna thank you live on air. But I do wanna <laughs> thank him because this is this is such a sweet and and thoughtful gift to send us yeah. and it really does go with our set. So it's, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, if you send us mugs or electronics, we'll thank you live on air. <laughs> but I do wanna say, oh, by the way, I, I'm having like the damnedest time finding out who it was. But a fan sent me two board games, I think for my birthday. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanna say thank you, I'm trying to figure out who it was. Cuz some of the information around it seems to have lost in the trip to my desk. But, yeah. but thank you, I do Al appreciate that. Al Belzo on oh, time every so year nice, yeah. sends us uh, gift cards to Starbucks. Like, you guys are he so does. sweet. He does. Look, Very you nice supporting the show is everything that we need, everything that we want. So thank you, please don't feel like you need to give us any types of like material gifts. Like just support no. the show. That's That goes a long way and we appreciate your support. All right, with that said, uh, let's start off with some Trump related news later on in the show, we will give you updates on the fallout for Bloomberg following the Nevada debate. And we'll also talk a little bit in the post game. I actually wanna discuss how Elizabeth Warren, after performing really well last night during the debate, has decided to continue these dishonest smears against Sanders. And it sucks because I wanna give her credit like I did last night. And then she turns around and she does things that are just devastating. And disappointing to yeah. say the least. Anyway, yeah. we'll get to that in the post game. So become a member, go to tyt.com slash join. All right, so one of Donald Trump's buddies, Roger Stone, has been sentenced. Now keep in mind that prosecutors in the case originally called for seven to nine years behind bars for the seven charges that he was found guilty of. However, he was sentenced to 40 months in prison and two years of probation. Prosecutors had initially asked Stone to be sentenced to seven to nine years in prison, resting that recommendation on the severity of his crimes and behavior. Trump called that ask very unfair in a late night tweet. At that point, Attorney General William Barr overrode the recommendation the next day, saying seven years in prison would be too harsh a sentence. Now, none of the prosecutors who won the case at trial signed the revised sentencing memo and two new DC US Attorney's Office supervisors were assigned, exposing how politically charged the case has become inside the Justice Department. Now this has led to calls for William Barr to resign. Federal judges have gotten together and they had some sort of secret meeting to discuss what's happening. It's very unclear what the outcome of that meeting will be, but for now, this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a much lower sentence, 40 months, for serious crimes that were committed. So mm -hmm. let me give you those details. Stone was convicted last fall of lying to Congress, perjury, and threatening a witness regarding his efforts for Trump's 2016 campaign. He, he threatened that witness by asking him if he wants to die. Yeah, and it was a bit vague, but so it could be interpreted as a threat. If any other person, any average American mm -hmm. did that, if they tampered in some sort of investigation or threatened a witness in the middle of an investigation, they would not have any leniency mm -hmm. in response to that. Yeah, so yeah, I guess, um, I, I mean, we're sort of waiting for him to just pardon him outright, right? Um, if he doesn't, if he gets 40 months, like I don't like that there was any influence over it. 
But if if the prosecutors had come out and said 40 months, I would have been probably fine with that. If he ends up serving 40 months or 30 for good behavior, which he won't get because he has literally never exhibited good behavior in any way, um, I think that that would be acceptable. He needs to spend time in prison for what he did. I, I agree. Look, I, I guess I'm fine, you're right. If we had not known about what the initial recommendation was, the sentencing guidelines from the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. Had we not known the type of influence that Trump has and how he meddled in the outcome of this case. Had we not known that William Barr intervened the way that he did. Mm -hmm. I think that we probably would be fine with 40 months behind bars. But the fact of the matter is you now have the executive branch manipulating our justice system to a way that is politically beneficial to themselves and to their friends. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I know we've we've gone over now a couple of times this story has developed, I mean, way back, but even just lately. And so like you start to get into like the details and everything, but just like top level view, this guy is a Trump ally who tried to interfere in the investigation of him, got caught, is being sentenced and is going to face much less time, possibly no time because Trump is going to stop him from facing time after he tried to help him during the, that's insane. That is the most obvious corrupt swampy behavior that I can imagine. And it has taken the 24 hour a day you know, attentions of Fox News to convince people that Roger Stone and Donald Trump are actually the victims in all this. So the judge, Amy Berman Jackson, made a very similar point. And CNN reports that as that Stone's actions, according to Judge Berman, led to an inaccurate, incorrect, and incomplete report from the House on Russia, WikiLeaks, and the Trump campaign, Jackson told the court. She also said she believes Stone's threats to witness Randy Credico deserved a stronger sentence. Mm -hmm. um, now, I want to give you a few more statements from the judge, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion about what the final outcome of this will be, or what we think it will be. It's only a prediction. Now, uh, as the judge read from the bench, some of the obscenity laced emails to Credico uh, that supported his conviction for witness tampering, Stone turned briefly with a half smirk on his face and looked in the direction of his two rows of supporters in the room. Otherwise, Stone sat quietly and took notes as the judge spoke. So, you know, that, that yeah. type of incredibly smug behavior as the President of the United States is meddling yeah. in the outcome of this case. Um, and, you know, the judge also said at his core, Mr. Stone is an insecure person who craves and recklessly pursues attention. That is the nicest thing anyone's ever said about him. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> but she's also right. I mean, he does strike me as. Just this incredibly insecure, sad mm -hmm. He's man. the saddest sort of person. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what's likely to happen. Uh, there are all sorts of rumors, there's some speculation about how Stone might not even spend a single night in jail or prison, mm -hmm. I should say. So let's talk about that. Um, so. Tucker Carlson has been signaling something to Trump in the Roger Stone case. And nothing made that clearer than the segment that you're about to watch. Take a look. President Trump could end this tra travesty in an instant with a pardon, and there are indications tonight that he will do that. In the last 24 hours, he's done the same for former police commissioner Bernie Carrick and for financier Michael Milken. Democrats will become unhinged if Trump pardons Roger Stone, but they're unhinged anyway. What has happened to Roger Stone should never happen to anyone in this country, of any political party, to Democrats as well, ever. It's completely immoral, it's wrong. Fixing it is the right thing to do, and in the end, that is the only thing that matters. So, he's so concerned. Right. But poor, like, he's just concerned about the morality of it all. Threatening a witness in the middle of an investigation is a crime. Mm -hmm. So, Pretending as though the real victim here is the very person who committed that crime is so out of control and ridiculous. Yeah. And look, I would expect it from someone like Tucker Carlson. I'm not gonna pretend like I'm surprised. But make no mistake, Roger Stone threatened Randy Credico, who agreed to cooperate with Mueller's investigation into Russia's meddling in the US yeah. election. Yeah, this is what you get, unfortunately, when all of the president's political allies, media allies, and supporters out there in the population desperately want him to break the law on a regular basis. Right. You are never going to be able to convince them that it's a bad thing that they broke the law. That's what they want.
Yeah, and, and the language that Trump uses on Twitter is very similar to the language that you heard from Tucker Carlson in that segment because Trump takes his cues from cable news. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he likes to present himself as this strong man, but there are two things that are true of Trump. He is easily manipulated mm -hmm. and he is incredibly thin skinned and seeks validation. And so if you say complimentary things about him on the one cable news network he likes to watch incessantly, well then he might grant yeah. you favors. <laughs> um, if you're critical of him, he will use any and all of his power to attempt to destroy you, starting with Twitter, right? Yeah. A, a rough description of Trump could read, he's an insecure person who craves and recklessly pursues attention. That's exactly right, that's, that's exactly right. Maybe that's why he has such uh, admiration for Roger Stone. Yeah. Well. Tucker Carlson's little spiel there was unsurprising. But one person who seemed to be pretty principled throughout all of this was Judge Napolitano, one of the other personalities on Fox. But he has decided to go in a completely different direction in the clip you're about to watch. The judge should interrogate the departed prosecutors about what they knew about this four person and when they knew it and why they quit. And then determine whether or not the integrity of Stone's trial right. was adversely affected by this juror. It's, it seems inconceivable that it was not. Now, I don't know what the president is going to do, but this is, this is absolutely- Wait, are you suggesting he might pardon him? I'm suggesting he might pardon Roger Stone today, because the minute he signs that pardon, this judge is divested of jurisdiction in the case, and Stone walks out of the courtroom. That's the reason I'm saying only a pardon can fairly undo this mess. This is not about politics and it's not about friendship. It's about the constitution and human decency. So this is a talking point that you've probably heard from Trump or Trump supporters, that the four person in the jury mm -hmm. uh, was somehow uh, too biased to be the four person, was mm -hmm. against Trump. Uh, and so as a result, uh, manipulated the outcome of the jury's decision. That is actually not the case. In fact, uh, jurors have spoken to the press about this and said, no, uh, the four person went out of their way to ensure that uh, we were thorough. And even if that weren't the case, we would have uh, come out with this ruling anyway. Yeah. Uh, again, Stone was uh, guilty of all seven charges. And, and that would be a great response. If Trump actually cared about supposed bias on the part of the four person, but of course he doesn't care. And of course, in cases like this, there are mechanisms to try to weed out bias. Second of all, you're not gonna find a single person in America that doesn't have a view positive or negative towards Donald Trump. By his logic, there is no one who can stand as you know a jury of a peer to a, a supporter of Donald Trump like Roger Stone. Um, and third of all, while they have mechanisms to weed out the political bias, why would they want to? Why not let someone slip through as an excuse, a cheap excuse to just pardon him in the end? Especially if you know that he definitely did what he's being charged with. Well, for now, Trump is not planning on pardoning Roger Stone, but I don't, I don't really trust anything he says. If you were to, if I had to take a bet, I would bet that Roger Stone will not see a single day behind bars. Here's what Trump tweeted though. I'm not going to do anything in terms of the great powers bestowed upon a president of the United States. I want the process to play out. I think that's the best thing to do because I'd love to see Roger exonerated. And I'd love to see it happen because I personally think he was treated very unfairly. So how could he possibly be exonerated? Well, his team, Roger Stone and his attorneys plan to appeal the case or ask for a retrial. And so that's what he's waiting for. But if he doesn't get what he wants, there's no question in my mind that Trump will pardon him. I agree, Yeah, I agree. I don't know if he won't spend a day, but he's definitely not, like if Trump doesn't get reelected, Roger Stone's not still gonna be in prison. That seems crazy to me, the thought. And by the way, just a quick clarification or correction, that statement that I read from Trump was a statement, it was not a tweet. My mistake, I said it was a tweet out of habit because that's usually how he communicates with everyone. Yes, <laughs> yeah. especially in official context. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, let's move on to one other abusive, abuse of power story related to Trump. And this is also pretty terrifying, Donald Trump, Donald Trump doesn't have a lot of affection for the intelligence community. However, he just named the acting director of national intelligence. 
And he is certainly one of Trump's loyalists. He's actually also a well known Twitter troll and his name is Richard Grinnell. Now he has been acting as the ambassador to Germany. Germany has been miserable with him as the ambassador representing mm-hmm. the United States. And so they were desperate for the US to recall him, but they got their wish. Unfortunately, now we have to deal with him as the acting director of national intelligence. And that's terrifying considering his previous statements about women, his previous statements about people within his own party, but more importantly, Mm -hmm. how much of a Trump loyalist he really is. Now Trump announced his you know, new role on Twitter, writing, I'm pleased to announce that our highly respected ambassador to Germany, Richard Grinnell, will become the acting director of national intelligence. Rick has represented our country exceedingly well, and I look forward to working with him. And then he goes on to thank Joe McGuire for the wonderful job he has done. And we look forward to working with him closely, perhaps in another capacity within the administration. It's weird that considering how highly respected he is, he's just making him the acting you know, DNI rather than going through the process where the Republicans in the Senate would just confirm him, right? I mean, there's nothing crazy or obscene that would come up during that process. He's so highly respected, just you know, put him up and have him confirmed. I'm so, well, glad you men- I'm so glad you mentioned that, mm-hmm. John. Now, since he has been confirmed by the Senate for his role as ambassador to Germany, he does not have to be confirmed as acting director of national intelligence. Which doesn't make any sense. Which doesn't They're make any sense, and we should change the law. But again, according to Politico, Grinnell is already Senate confirmed. So Trump can name him acting DNI under the Federal Vacancies Reform Act. So who is this guy? Let's go a little deeper and figure out how much of a disaster this really is. Well, he's a former Fox News contributor. He's known to be a fierce online warrior for Trump, who has been unafraid to parrot the Trump line and lecture his host country, which was Germany, so much that they called on the White House to recall him from his ambassador post in Berlin. Also, he has a history of saying pretty terrible things to women, including women in his own party. I should note he's openly gay, so he is now the first openly gay acting director of national intelligence. But just because he's gay doesn't mean he's a good person, he's actually a pretty terrible person. Lori Blackford, a producer for Chris Matthews long before he came to MSNBC, Recalled remarks Grinnell allegedly made to a fellow campaign staffer on the 1992 Bush Quayle reelection campaign. She was quoted as saying, one of our staff people came in and had on a flowery dress and red shoes. And Rick, meaning Richard Grinnell, looked at her and said, didn't your mother ever tell you only whores and very small children wear red shoes? Is that like a common phrase? I've never heard that before. I really like red shoes, actually. I Uh-oh. red pumps. Um, I I do not get paid for sex, so I guess you're a kid at heart. I might be an exception um, to that rule. I don't know. That's it's such a weird thing to say. Both obviously sexist, misogynist, and totally inappropriate, and weird at the same time that he could end up being the Democratic nominee. <laughs> God, <laughs> the state of our country. As my brother who has a baby at home and is very stressed out likes to say, our lives are in shambles, mm-hmm. okay? We're it's all <laughs> shambles as far as the eye can see. It's just, it's so much. And one other thing I wanted to bring to everyone's attention, Grinnell was infamously fired from his role as national security advisor to the 2012 Mitt Romney campaign after a right wing backlash over his being openly gay. So that was wrong, what what the Romney campaign did was wrong. So two things can be true, Mm -hmm. Grinnell can just be an incredibly flawed, terrible human being. And Romney can also be wrong for firing him over his sexual sexual identity, but or sexual orientation. But one thing that I do want to say is I think the Romney angle also informed Trump's decision in picking Grinnell. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Romney was the only Republican who voted to convict Trump on one of the articles of impeachment, which was abuse of power. And I'm sure that Trump is kind of like, you know, oh, a little cherry on top. Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead and, you know, name him acting national. By the way, think about how scary this is. You don't think that the Trump administration would use, you know, our intelligence community to spy on his political rivals or people he doesn't like? 
No, because what if he got caught? Think about the consequences. Oh yeah, I mean. Think about the consequences. Right. Yeah, it's also, I, I know this is just this is a thing that a lot of Americans who are um, uh, not straight and Republicans have to deal with, but it's just so weird that like, you're forced out of an advising role in national security. Has nothing to do with anything to do with your identity. But just your identity is enough that like regular Republicans insist you be fired. And you just try to find another position in that same party that like is fundamentally as you? evil as they were. I mean, I know that that's a difficult thing. And if you believe certain things politically, like what else are you supposed to do? But that's, man, that's gotta, it's gotta suck. I mean, so does he, but that, that's gotta suck. I think the real losers in this entire situation are the American people because Trump has proven over and over again that he has no problem abusing his power. And if he takes all of these top positions within the intelligence community and fills them with his loyalists, he can abuse his power further. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Warrantless wiretapping was a huge problem under the Bush administration. We found out about the indiscriminate spying on American citizens through the NSA under the Obama administration. I mean, they abuse their power as well, but Trump is a completely different animal, which is why when you have a president in office who you like and they abuse their power, you need to think ahead and consider what kind of impact that would have mm -hmm. if someone you don't like is in office? Yeah, yeah, and also, I mean, like we've rightly pointed out that he's got this terrible reputation, and most likely that's why Trump knows about him and likes him in the first place, is because of, you know, he supports Trump and he's awful. That's all it really takes. But also, like while we disagree with a lot of what you know various officials inside the intelligence community would do and have done, I still also think that you probably should be qualified in some way for that position. <laughs> and this guy isn't in any like I'm imagining like I got this job yeah. without any like prior news experience or anything, which was a questionable decision on no, all of it your wasn't. part. You proved your. Let me just Thank be clear you. about I'm, that. Yes. You proved yourself. He Thank would, you. He it's would send joke. in like correspondent videos for our yes. TYT University show, and he was great. I'm just I'm just being self-deprecating. I made the decision to bring him on. But not this a big is, deal. She did. I make good decisions. Thank you. I appreciate the life <laughs> you've given me. Uh, <laughs> but th this is not like you can learn. The DNI, I'm guessing it's complicated. I mean, we have what, 17 different organizations involved in the collection of international intelligence. We have to synthesize all of that. You have to know these sorts of things. Wouldn't we want someone who has some experience in that? We would, but here's the thing, Trump of course does not. He has no interest whatsoever in any of that working. He doesn't have to weed through resumes, he just chooses somebody he likes because he wants it to grind to a halt. I mean that that apparently, I forget exactly who it was in the intelligence committee, but they briefed Congress like five days ago on the likelihood that, that Russia is working right now to get Trump reelected. That is really inconvenient if you're Donald Trump. Why would you want that sort of briefing to even happen? Just hire some loyalist who's going to make it difficult for the intelligence community to do its job. And even if they do their job, he'll provide one more stopping point for that information before it can get to anyone important. Something to think about as we go to break. It is. All right, when we come back, we'll switch gears, move away from Trump related news and talk a little bit about the aftermath of the Nevada debate. I also want to discuss how the Sanders campaign has decided to play offense a little bit, which is so important considering mm -hmm. how, const how consistently they're attacked. We have that for you and more when we return. We hope you're enjoying this free clip from the Young Turks. If you want to get the whole show and more exclusive content while supporting independent media, become a member at tyt.com slash join today. In the meantime, enjoy this free segment. Welcome back to TYT, Anna and John with you. John is the host of Damage Report here on this network. And nice. he's one of our top hosts. Nailed it, that was great, thank you. All right, okay. just making sure I do right by you. Uh, just a quick announcement about TYT's affiliate program. If you're looking to help TYT and support this show, there's one way you can do it. There's many ways you can do it, but one of the ways is the affiliate program. So, so far we have signed up 725 affiliates, and these are people who are supporters of the show who are helping us 
cell membership. And if you're interested in doing that, there are there's a financial upside for you, but more importantly, you help to keep the show independent and sustainable. You can learn more by going to tyt.com slash win win, tyt.com slash win win. They're also having weekly conference calls where TYT affiliates are connecting from around the country. God, that sounds fun, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, Christian Mingle and like, but it's only TYT and not. Oh, do you get like, what I'm saying? Like, the, like you had to come up with an example of fun. And the first thing you thought of was Christian Mingle. No, no, just like you know how there's like, <laughs> yeah, it's this exclusive. Is not for dating, it's by exclusive. The way. It's exclusive. But I mean, it's not not for dating. I mean, exactly. No, it's not for dating. Yeah. Um, yes, it's exactly like Christian Mingle <laughs> minus the religion and the dating. Plug. Okay, let's just let's. <laughs> no, let's let's run this as an ad. Let's cut that. Anyway, plug. it's great. Yeah. It's awesome, and you can make money doing it. Yes, exactly. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about what our members have to say about the stories and our coverage. Megan E writes in and says, Warren had already murdered him, meaning Bloomberg. I don't know why he offered her the assist with that Joe comment. I think these are probably older. Let me refresh this. So Brentacorn writes in and says, anyone who thinks there is actual tension between John and Anna doesn't get what real friendship looks like. No, there's tension. <laughs> Oh, but maybe there is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, John. People really think? I don't. I don't think people really do. I, mm. John and I are super close, and yeah. just to prove how close we are, I let him watch my dog time to time. Like I don't do that with most people. And I like her enough that I actually give it back. Which just goes against every instinct I have. <laughs> All right, real quick, some super chat comments. Omar writes in and says, shame on Warren for now deciding that it's convenient for her to take super PAC money from millionaires. Yeah, That is also a, a news story that maybe we'll get also talk about that in the post game today. Proud that Bernie is now and still the only candidate with a backbone who will fight for me. And um, Devious Devil says, TYT hmm. needs to sell a salt shaker with Anna on it. That's a good idea. Yeah. It could be an Anna shaped salt shaker. That'd be pretty cool. Let's make it, yeah. fun people. All right, well, let's talk about some of what happened last night during the debate and what the discussion is about today, because this is a pretty huge story. Last night during the Nevada Democratic primary debate, Bernie Sanders was the only candidate, the only person up on that stage who answered yes to a very provocative question by Chuck Todd. Take a look. There's a very good chance none of you are going to have enough delegates to the Democratic National Convention to clinch this nomination. Okay? If that happens, I want all of your opinions on this. Should the person with the most delegates at the end of this primary season be the nominee, even if they are short of a majority? Senator Sanders, I'm going to let you go last here because I know your view on this. <laughs> Whatever the rules of the Democratic Party are, they should be followed. And if they have a process, which I believe okay. they do, I'm trying to do so this yes, everybody to else, fast. everybody can do. Can so you do. want the convention to work its will? Yes. Convention working its will means that people have the delegates that are pledged to them, and they keep those delegates until so the leading you come person? to the convention. No. All okay. Of the people. By the rules. Yes or no? Leading person with the delegates should they be the nominee or not? No. Let the process work its way out. Not necessarily. Not to lose. Senator control. Klobuchar. Let the process work. Senator Sanders. Well, the process includes 500 superdelegates on the second ballot. So I think that right. the will of the people should okay. put down yes. Okay. Right. Thank you guys. Most votes should become the nominee. Five no's and a yes. So there is, this is such an incredible story. There's a reason uh, why, and, and look, to be fair, I think if the tables were turned and let's say Warren was the front runner, mm. I think he would answer in the same way, right? So. But that's my speculation. Let me give you the subtext here because I think it is relevant. As the, as New York Magazine writes, the subtext here is that the candidate most likely to arrive in Milwaukee with a majority of pledged delegates, i.e. those in caucuses and primaries, is Bernie Sanders. It's what the projections say and what logic says too. But as the strongest candidate, Sanders is also the candidate most likely to fit Todd's hypothetical of someone with a plurality, but not the majority of pledged delegates, mm -hmm. right? So if he has the most delegates, but he doesn't have the majority, he, Bernie Sanders believes the right thing to do is to give that person the nomination, mm -hmm. right? Now, it. Some would argue it's convenient for him to say that because he's the front runner and he has the most, does he have the most delegates now? 
I don't know the updated count actually, but I right. do know that he's gotten more votes in both of the states that we've had so far. That's right, exactly. Um, so let me give you, okay, so give me your thoughts on that. Uh, I think it was an absolute disgrace that five people answered the way that they did. Yep. I think it should be the story of the day, the scandal of the day. Um, it was our lead off story on the damage report. I just finished an op ed uh, that is mostly about that. Um, all of them should be facing an incredible amount of pressure. And I know that they won't um, because their supporters aren't gonna be calling for it. The vast majority of the people in this country want the person they like to win. Principles really don't enter into it. And what I love is that we can occasionally come together around things like, hey, doesn't it seem crazy that in the electoral college you can get more votes but still lose? Hey, wouldn't it be cool if the person with the most votes wins? Oh wait, this time it's not mine? And eh, then screw that whole thing. No, I think if more people support one candidate, especially if it's not even close, how could you possibly give the middle finger to all of them and say, no, we're gonna decide. It's been a fun little goof these primaries and caucuses, but it's time for the adults in the room to decide. How could anyone call themselves a Democrat and hold such a fundamentally undemocratic stance? This story further soured my perspective on Elizabeth Warren. The mm -hmm. way she answered yeah. made me sour on her further. But Chris Matthews had a rare moment of clarity last night because he realized that everyone on that stage who answered no, did so because they realized that they're losing and Bernie Sanders is winning. In fact, here's the video, here's what he said. There's only one candidate there who believes he's gonna have the most delegates going into Milwaukee. And we know it was, he was the guy that said that person should be the winner. Everybody else said tonight, I will not have the most delegates. They all made it official. They were not gonna give the win to the guy with the, or the person with the most delegates. That was so telling tonight. Today, it was an acknowledgement that Bernie is the winner, not the winner. The winner so far in this whole fight, and he may be the winner all the way, and I think they think so. So if you're a member of the show, write in right now, because I do wanna hear from you and hear what you have to think. We'll read some of your comments in just a few moments. But one person who's not happy about this is Marianne Williamson. Mm. So she put out a tweet, and these are strong words, and I really like it. She says, the Democratic Party should be on notice. If you even think about using superdelegates to take the nomination from someone who has the plurality of delegates going into Milwaukee, we the people will not take it lying down. Mm. Now, Warren disagrees. In fact, she, in an interview with Chris Matthews, tried to defend her position on all of this and said, uh, the following, according to a reporter's tweet, Elizabeth Warren on MSNBC on why she isn't supportive of going with the candidate who gets the most delegates on first ballot. Quote, we need to pick a nominee who can beat Donald Trump. And that means we gotta have someone who is talking to all parts of the party, it's important. That, that is was insane. A, that wasn't even a subtle jab at, at Bernie Sanders, that was a sucker punch. And she's been doing that more and more often. And I put my own political feelings aside and just look at the facts as they stand. Every time she's done that, it has hurt her campaign. So I don't know why, you know, on the heels of a great debate performance last mm -hmm. night, she has decided to go in this direction of, you know, using a disgusting Democratic establishment talking point about how Bernie isn't suited to beat Trump. Are you kidding me yeah. right now? Yeah, it's a weird move uh, to make. Um, what what she said about uh, first of all that about the first ballot. I, I understand that they do the ballot process. I find it frustrating to talk about it again, as I say a lot, in that sort of sanitized sense. Uh, it's it's the first ballot, but what they mean by that is it's the result of people voting. The stuff later is very few people in a room who've been senators and congressmen and all those, then they get to vote. I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about the actual people voting in primaries and caucuses around the country. That's what presumably we've been doing this whole thing for. So I kind of think that that's pretty important. If you are going to say screw all of that, instead we need to worry about X, I would come up with something better than he doesn't speak to all parts of the party when he's been dominating you in terms of the number of votes so far. So if he's not speaking to all of them, how can you possibly make the case that you are? And especially someone who can beat Donald Trump. Look, I, I like Warren less you know, with every passing day as yep. she's going down this road. 
But if you want to talk about who can beat Donald Trump, I would love to sit down and have a talk about the general election matchups going back literally years. Yes. In some of them, Warren does beat Donald Trump, but the margin is always far, far closer than it is with Bernie Sanders. And of all of the zombie myths in politics that we have to destroy, the idea that any of them other than possibly Biden, who also does well in matchups, to show I'm not biased, I will give him credit for that too. Even sometimes like a point up on Bernie Sanders. The idea that any of the others who are often tied with Bernie Sanders or with Donald Trump are actually losing to him can say that electability should be the guideline. Like the people are already clear, look at who they think is most likely to win. They're saying Bernie Sanders and they're voting accordingly. You're exactly right. In the post game today, that's for our members, we will talk about some of the other attacks that Bernie San- that Elizabeth Warren has done just over the last 24 hours against Bernie Sanders, including talk of his medical records and just really below the belt nonsense that's beyond disappointing. But I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna go a little further. I think that all of this, including her, you know, new willingness to take super PAC money, you know, funds from billion millionaires, shows that she was malleable when it comes to her political identity, depending on what's convenient and politically beneficial for her in any given moment. And that's really sad to see. But more importantly, does she really think that she has a chance against Trump? I I think she has a chance, but her political instincts have been a disaster, Mm -hmm. right? So look, there's policy and then there are political instincts. And she started seeing a giant dip in the polls back in November when she rolled out uh, her specific policy for Medicare for all, right? Uh, the how she would roll it out, how mm-hmm. she would fund it. And it's because she very clearly moved to the center. She bought into all the pressure, probably from the former Obama aides that are now supporting her campaign, mm-hmm. all this pressure to move to the center because they think that that's more appealing. Obviously not, certainly not in the, in the Democratic Party. So if she's easily manipulated like that or malleable in this way and has these terrible political instincts, you think that that's gonna work against Trump? I mean, she's the one who put out that DNA test and that also was Mm. poor in terms of her political instincts. So for her to make this accusation against Bernie is really pathetic when he's the only Democrat who has a populist economic message that's that's real, that he truly believes in, that he's fought for for decades, and it really does resonate with Americans across the board, regardless of political identity. I agree. All right, well, let's take our break. Actually, no, I wanted to read a few of, of the member comments. Um, if you'd like to become a member and support the show, you can do so by going to tyt.com slash join. Eclectic Miscellaneous says, the rules of the Democratic Party must be followed says the multi-billionaire that they changed the rules for so he could be on the stage or the debate stage while other candidates who followed the rules were forced to drop out. Yeah. Such a devastating point. Mariguana's number three fan says the front runner should be the one to get the nomination, plain and simple. Same argument that you made, John. Uh, Cam J says it, it is very obvious that the party establishment is looking to make it go to a second ballot and use superdelegates and the delegates of other candidates to stop Bernie from winning. Mm -hmm. Remember, there were already like, they were already testing the waters with bringing superdelegates back. You remember Mm -hmm. that? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, my hope is that because uh, other than Bernie Sanders, there are five people who are to varying degrees deluded about what the country actually thinks about them and what their chances are of winning, that all of them will stay in thinking, well, if I just stick around until the convention, then you know some people in Democratic leadership can, can choose me. They can flip off the voters and say, no, this is gonna be our candidate. And the thing is, if you, like I said, I think in my live video this morning before the damage report, if you have like three or four people who all have similar levels levels of support, then they'll be splitting the delegates and no one will end up with the majority. But if you have eight people splitting the vote, then a bunch of them are not gonna meet the threshold for delegates at all. And in fact, that means more of the delegates will go to the people who do meet the threshold, including Bernie Sanders. And so all of them getting involved in this plot, it's sort of like a prisoner's dilemma. They're screwing each other over and possibly making it more likely that we don't have a contested convention. Right, but look, to be fair, the DNC has been consistent when Bernie Sanders, when it was between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, they didn't get mad at him for refusing to concede immediately, mm-hmm. right? They didn't. No, they were very fair to him. It's they not were. dangerous to have a long primary or whatever. 
It's I know. whoever gets the most votes wins. Yeah, that simple. You could write it on a post-it note. Brought to you by Amy Klobuchar's state. It'd be so simple. Think about it. I know, but they don't believe in democracy. I think that's pretty clear. We got to take a quick break. When we come back, we have some more news from the Sanders campaign, including their new decision to pivot toward playing offense, and I think that's important. Later on in the show, we will also talk about some of Bloomberg's strategy when it comes to donors. It's pretty disgusting. All of that and more when we return.